Um, thank you, Sivan. Uh, it's uh, good to be back at a PSD conference after about 10 years. So uh, uh, glad to be here and meet uh, familiar faces and new faces uh, in person. Um, this talk is more or less uh, identical uh, to the talk that my um, co-programmer, um, uh, Santosh Raju, um, presented at Asia BSD Con um, earlier, earlier this year. And um, we've done a little bit more work on it, uh, but nothing to show for it uh, that we've published. Um, so I'll just stick to the, uh, to the, you know, the, the baseline uh, of the talk. Um, and uh, essentially, um, what I'm hoping um, uh, to do with this talk is not really to present the guts of the uh, development um, cycle or the experience, but rather um, to kind of um, share the opportunity that I realized after 10 years of kernel programming uh, that a certain methodology or approach to coding can actually bring to kernel programming. Uh, and uh, I feel like because this is uh, this code was uh, quite intrusive and at the deepest part of the VM uh, subsystem, um, um, typically you'd expect a lot of chaos because um, you know uh, NetBSD's VM um, powers about I think it's about 11 CPU architectures and about 70 platforms, so it's it's really like a huge amount of dependencies and a lot of things can go wrong. Um, so really, um, uh, most of the uh, technical details are uh, in the man pages. Uh, we won't cover that. Um, but I, I just wanted to um, kind of uh, go over the, the broad um, sort of storyline with the hope that uh, there are, that I'm not preaching to the choir and that actually there are people from uh, you know, other BSDs and uh, also a uh, diversity of uh, port maintainers uh, in here. So it's a little bit of evangelism as well, uh, if you bear with me. All right. Um, so this is the background. Um, the background is that um, all the current BSDs um, have a very simple implementation for keeping track of RAM on the machine. Um, essentially, it maps to a very uh, simple uh, static array. Um, and uh, this is the famous VM FISSEG max uh, um, hash defined that uh, you know, has come up for discussion when large amounts of RAM show up or the, uh, in the x86 world, the EA20 map is very fragmented and then things happen. Um, and this is obviously from a, a really you know, a long time ago uh, when RAM was uh, you know, not so much and the layouts were not as complicated as they are on modern machines. Um, and so um, the, the discussion about this or the, or the idea for this uh, uh, project came up from the need for um, virtual, mem uh, virtual machines to have um, memory added uh, and removed dynamically uh, at runtime. And right now we have a balloon driver, which is a, a, a hack to kind of um, uh, remove allocated memory from a virtual machine. Um, but um, there's no way to put more in uh, for NetBSD at least and for the other BSDs, I believe. Um, so, so we said, okay, how do we uh, take on this problem? This is really, you know, the tentacles go really all over the place. It's really hard to, um, you know, pull things out and separate them. How, where do we start? You know, I mean, there's, um, there's uh, VM FISMEM is a global variable and it's strewn all over the place and it's used, you know, by every bit of the VM code everywhere. So the first uh, job, obviously, was not to try and do any hot plugging, but to clean up. Uh, and so we said, okay, we're, you know, we, we want to use something more dynamic than an array, but we want to clean up so that we have a hold on uh, sort of, um, you know, the complexity, otherwise it just explodes. So we said, okay, we'll clean it up. Um, and so, and so um, that's when, you know, the idealist uh, you know, shows up and, okay, so now we've got a chance for a brand new API. So I went away and designed this massive API with, like, tags and cache uh, attributes and everything. Uh, and then I had it all specced out. We wrote ATF tests for it. Um, 
and then uh, we ran it by people who actually had a lot of experience designing and building these things, uh, and they ba basically came back and said, "Sorry, I mean, this, I mean, this looks interesting," <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so um, and we hadn't, you know, it hadn't gotten the kernel, uh, and uh, so Chuck um, Silva was really helpful with a lot of uh, a lot of feedback. He uh, helped with the initial integration of UVM, uh, the virtual memory management uh, manager for NetBSD, into the kernel. Uh, and so, you know, uh, idealism gave way to um, sort of pragmatism, and we um, decided to um, kind of work the other way. So we thought, okay, we'll, we'll try and put um, what exists and what we've cleaned up uh, to kind of interface with the rest of the kernel uh, through a simpler um, API. Uh, and so that would mean that we'd separate out the existing uh, API and expose it via header files and hide everything else in file scope. Uh, and then, mo most importantly, have a way to test, unit test uh, all these functions. This is the first time in, I think, maybe 30 years since the BSD projects have uh, begun that uh, actually these functions were tested, actually, <laughs> using <laughs> unit tests. So, <laughs> so, uh, so it was, you know, um, it was kind of interesting. And, um, and uh, we, um, yeah, so, so, a lot of the a lot of the detail was basically trying to get this uh, situation going. So, like, clean up the code, uh, you know, sort them into separate files, uh, and then try and uh, organize getting the uh, specific functions unit tested in a, in a disciplined manner. Um, and uh, we made the choice to kind of uh, do this first. So, like, this was in the live uh, current uh, tree. So, uh, so, you know, because you can, you can go away on a limb and, and try and kind of, you know, create APIs and then everything breaks when you try and integrate. So we use the approach that before we try and unit test everything, we'll try and do the reorganization in the live source in a way that uh, doesn't change functionality, but then we can also uh, sort of put the tests on top of them. Uh, and so we initially got uh, UVM fizzseg and uh, .c and .h, the code reorg, into current before the tests were uh, in place. And now it was in a, in a position where we could start looking at the unit tests. And Santosh actually did this entire project on a Windows laptop with Sigwin. So that's a testament to NetBSD's code, uh, code cleanliness. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, so the reorganization uh, didn't really affect the ability for uh, NetBSD to boot. Um, and, you know, life went on as usual in current. Uh, we didn't... Um, um, we didn't uh, mess with that, uh, but then this is where sort of the modifications now started getting interesting. So we essentially um, figured out how to now now everything everything to do with the array uh, management, the segment array uh, management went into that file uvmphysseg.c, and so now you've got like a little module that you can actually test. And so we uh, literally did a hash include uvmphysseg.c inside of uh, a user land. Uh, you know, uh, test rig, and so now we had enough to compile a separate user land binary, which then we could run unit tests on. Um, and the UVM fizzseg.c that we were using was not a copy, it was a live copy that was in the kernel. So, uh, you know, uh, everything that we were testing was already in the kernel, but we were testing it completely in user land, which was pretty neat. Um, in that process, obviously, uh, you know, you have to export a subset of the kernel API to the uh, to use land. Rump does this by namespace rehashing and so on and so forth. If people are familiar with Rump uh, on NetBSD, uh, but this is much simpler. We, you know, this this code doesn't really use uh, you know a lot of um, API infrastructure. So uh, you know, essentially it was KMM malloc being stubbed by malloc, uh, things like that. Uh, so it's fairly straightforward. Um, and um, um, so, so, so now we could focus on the guts of the of the move from you know um, static array to uh, RB tree, uh, and so uh, we said, okay, well, you know, what are the other options? And we went through the iterations of that, and and essentially it boiled down the decision about RB trees boiled down to, uh, you know, what was available that was easiest to use and gave us the best promised performance. And literally, uh, you know, NetBSD's RB tree uh, implementation was just right there waiting for us to use it. Um, and uh, it made uh, technical sense because the previous code had, I mean, an array, if you want to insert, uh, you know, things into an array, you, you have to copy over, uh, you know, uh, bits of data and then insert. 
And so uh, there's a lot of overhead. And so there were a couple of algorithms using hash define. So you could, you know, there was hash, de uh, hash define uh, for binary searching for um, specific uh, items in the array or for random search and so on and so forth. So there were three options. And we said, well, you know, all of that goes away and the RB tree takes care of that. And so we just have one, there's no compile time option now for searching in this array of segments, of memory segments. Um, so there are no multiple strategies for maintaining segments and obviously less code clutter. And yeah, there were a couple of other options. Q was anyway not, a, not an option because it, it was the worst of both worlds, but yeah, arbitrary was there and we thought we'd go with it. Uh, and we also thought uh, we'll do some performance analysis from user space because hey, that's uh, cool. So we'll come to that at the end. Um, some of the details, so uh, essentially, um, um, the, the thing that's interesting for the rest of the VM system is, um, you know, what does this bit of, um, what does this uh, page offset in RAM uh, point to? What it, the, the VM page structure, basically. So I, I want to look, uh, given, a, given a physical address, I want to have the pointer uh, to the data structure that represents that um, page of memory. That's essentially uh, what, the, what this array um, gives you. Uh, and so we uh, essentially um, abstracted the idea of the index into the segment uh, with a sort of abstract um, sort of uh, data structure called UVM physic underscore T. But initially, we, before we did that, we ensured that this abstraction was sitting on top of the array itself. Um, and so, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I went over this again. It was quite interesting. Uh, it was a huge number of uh, architectures to uh, port to. So, so yeah. So some of the challenges here, um, and then obviously the performance indications uh, implications. So uh, we'll look at that later. So we we introduced um, you know uh, certain sets of abstraction. So as you can see, um, previously you had global variables being um, uh, you know used uh, outside of the module and then you would have uh, sort of iteration through a macro and then we kind of hit everything behind explicit uh, function calls. Um, and it can be argued that, uh, you know, this is uh, more, um, less performance, but then um, the setup and many of these loops are actually run only at boot, boot time or during hot plug itself. Uh, but when it comes to actually searching for things in, when the system is running, you know, so this is not really so much of a hot path. Um, so we thought we'll, you know, we'll run with it and then we'll see. Uh, how it goes in terms of performance. Um, this uh, function came up because it was interesting to understand what a valid segment was. Um, a lot of uh, systems code uh, sort of ad hoc uh, puts in a placeholder value like minus one or uh, you know null or something to signify that you know an entry is invalid. Uh, and uh, it got interesting because we had to make this explicit and say, okay, what does this index uh, point to? Is this uh, you know is this a valid uh, address or is it a valid index and why is it a valid index or not? Uh, so we wanted to pull out that assumption uh, in terms of tests. So literally the approach was if there's anything that we had in doubt in terms of semantics or state, we'd write a test for it um, and make it explicit. Um, and this was, um, this was really useful because uh, I think this kind of took care of the idea of uh, the hero that we got uh, that we got introduced to this morning uh, because the hero can be reduced to ATF tests I think uh, this is my discovery uh, <laughs> so uh, you know a lot of the heroism is uh, holding the state in your head and you know being able to process that data and make uh, a call on design uh, but I feel like if you can make it explicit in these tests and you can automate the open source hero into uh, into tests by and large I'm not making this claim but uh, at least from my own ego, it was interesting to, you know, I became less relevant, basically. Um, so, um, so we, we uh, you know, it goes to, it doesn't need to be mentioned that uh, we did uh, quite a bit of test coverage and all the tests, uh, you know, they're live tested using Anita um, in the uh, NetBSD build system. So these are part of the formal uh, test rig for NetBSD. Uh, and, um, uh, essentially, what we did was we got the tests running so that the, uh, the, the, the objective was for the semantics and the state information to be exported explicitly in these tests. And we made sure that uh, the current implementation uh, could be tested rigorously first before we touched it with RBTree. We said we want the current implementation to be, uh, you know, uh, 
running under these tests. And, um, um, and so, um, uh, yeah, and so, where are we, sorry. Um, yeah, we had some interesting uh, situations. So the original um, uh, idea for um, uh, uh, VMFISSEG, the array, was uh, explicitly meant for boot time. So you boot up, uh, you populate your array uh, after machine-dependent code uh, passes through your memory, hardware-dependent memory tables, and then you populate the array, uh, and then that's it. You don't touch it uh, afterwards. Uh, but uh, we were interested, obviously, in you know, being able to plug in a new memory and pull out uh, bits of existing memory. Uh, and so immediately, um, that brings a lot of interesting uh, issues, especially fragmentation and how to manage stuff. Um, and um, in the process of this integration, um, you know, there were certain assumptions, like, for example, page face load uh, was just expected to succeed, because if you couldn't uh, you know, if you couldn't register a physical page during boot time, then that's like something serious is wrong, so you panic, basically. Uh, and so that was the assumption in the boot code. It was, it was avoid UVM page freeze load. Well, that's not great for testing, because we need to know if this function actually, uh, you know, did the right thing or not. And the function should have some way to return that information. So we uh, essentially edited uh, the function, um, you know, to return what happened to that load. And so there were similar uh, kinds of things that were uh, you know, uh, uh, modifications that we, that we did. So, yeah, so, sorry, I'm, I'm speaking, I'm going ahead of myself here. Um, but essentially, again, just to, you know, uh, repeat that, reiterate that point, it was to make, uh, you know, the test framework pull out all these assumptions that were inside a programmer's heads, you know, and just, you know, put it down in writing and make it as explicit as possible. Um, so, um, so, so here's, uh, here's a, like a slightly subtle one. Um, we, we kept getting this uh, failure for uh, get previous segments. So given uh, an array offset in that physseg array, uh, can you give, uh, the, the, the function is asked, can you give me the previous, uh, you know, um, uh, entry? Uh, and obviously it would be, in an array, it would be just, you know, minus, index minus one. Uh, but this was uh, failing for us, and this was kind of the situation in which that was happening. And for a minute, it had me going, wondering what the heck is going on. Um, and at this point, we had the RB3 uh, implementation as well. Um, so we were testing both together side by side. We had the test running on uh, the static array implementation and the RB3 implementation. Um, and what we discovered was that um, the reason that get prev was failing was because the assumption of what um, of the of the property of the of the handle uh, that we were passing through that to that function so for the array it would be the index value but for the rb tree it would be a pointer uh, and there were certain implications for that um, which i'll talk about in a second so this is the static array implementation so b is a loaded uh, segment the system knows about it it's already been uvm physic loaded uh, and therefore, the index, if you were inserting segments, would be in increasing, uh, monotonically increasing order. So zero, and then if a new one were, A was inserted, what would happen would be that that would get copied over, and then A would go in and zero. So you can, you can see here that uh, to refer to B initially, you would want to refer to the index uh, uh, value as zero, but then once the insert has been done, zero refers to A. So this means that the handle was not immutable. We were making the implicit assumption that the handle was immutable. But in this case, the handle was not immutable in this implementation. And so, you know, this brought it out. Um, whereas for the RB tree, there's no problem because the pointer remains the same. So, the, the, you know, the, the handle is immutable. Um, and so, uh, essentially, again, we exported that, uh, you know, assumption into a test and said, okay, well, we'll slap a test onto that so that we know exactly what's going on. Um, so... Um, yeah, so now the, the, the property, I mean, the, the behavior uh, of both implementations is explicit and is explicitly tested for. Um, right, uh, at that point in time, we were also supporting uh, conditional uh, compiles of the static. In fact, we still do have conditional compiles of the static. So you can use both in NetBSD right now. Uh, so you don't need to, 
actually use RB3. Uh, you can also use the old static implementation. Um, um, right, so guess what happened? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so at this point, I was on my own. Santosh um, wasn't very familiar with the NetBSD system itself, and it was, um, I was pr pretty pleased that I, you know, I was able to break down the problem in, um, in a language and in a context that he could understand as a user space programmer, and he was happy that he could actually get some you know, uh, work done on, uh, on kernel code. Uh, but at this point, I was on my own, basically, and I must give him a lot of credit. He's an amazing programmer, one of the best I've met, actually. Um, and, um, well, that happened. And normally, at this point, I'd be panicking because, like, if I didn't have all the state information out there, you know, it's the VM system. There's, like, a whole load of things that could be going wrong. Uh, but that wasn't the case. I mean, we had the tests and we knew exactly what was going on. So we could actually flip uh, assumptions inside the tests to figure out what was going on. And we quickly realized that um, the tests themselves assumed that uh, malloc would always be available, obviously, because the tests run in user space. Uh, but obviously, the kernel uh, doesn't have uh, malloc running when it starts off. You have to uh, figure out how to present malloc uh, you know, to the kernel that's booting. So that's a bootstrap problem that's very peculiar to, uh, uh, you know, a boot up situation. Um, I think FreeBSD has a, uh, a, a VM API, kind of, which does in a very kludgy way. I forget the name of the API now. But um, uh, anyway, but that's in a different context. Um, this, um, anyway, so we, essentially what we did was to um, kind of provide, um, so we tweaked the, the, the uh, the code a little bit so that we could um, uh, have backend functions to do the allocation a little bit like the pool allocator. I don't know if people have used the pool allocator, but um, um, pool cache allocator. But basically, your slab allocators, I think, have this backing um, function thing where you can, you know, allocate either device uh, addressable memory or actual, you know, system RAM memory. Uh, but anyway, we use the same kind of approach. So we had like a callback function that would get initialized at boot time, which did the static. Uh, allocation for uh, boot time RAM, and then once we figured out that page init done was, you know, done and KVM alloc could work, then we'd switch the allocators to the regular kernel memory allocator. Um, so that that was a little bit of a twist in the in the story, but um, um, but yeah, I mean, again, we got that. Uh, so we ex again that assumption we put it out in tests. So we explicitly put the, the you know the assumption of boot time allocation versus uh, you know uh, runtime allocation inside of tests. Um, so, um, at this point, uh, more or less, x86 was uh, um, working. We hadn't integrated code yet, mind, because uh, you can't do that. I mean, there's 70 architectures uh, going to get breaking if you start pushing code. So, um, so um, we started looking at, okay, so we're trying to, you know, uh, fragment memory and, uh, sorry, hot plug and, uh, and uh, replug memory. Uh, and we started looking at the, at the fragmentation problem. So, um, so you, you have a segment, and then the, um, so how NetBSD does this is that there is an array that essentially um, holds the physical um, data structures uh, of all the system pages in memory. Now, segments are not at page resolution. Segments are, it can be like a one gig uh, segment followed by uh, one megabyte segment followed by so on and so forth. But pages are 4K pages on NetBSD, I think on most architectures. Um, so PGS is an array of VM page uh, structures, and not pointers. These are actual structures. That's where the actual data about the pages are stored. So PGS is really important because, again, we've, we go back to the array problem where, um, as we saw in VM segment, uh, you know, that was an array, and then PGS is an array as well. So now we've got the same problem coming back at us. Uh, and uh, we were like, oh my gosh, now are we going to have to use the RB3 again, have to go over the whole thing again? But um, Extent to the, to the rescue. So Extent is a really cool um, Extent manager. So any namespace you give it, it'll manage the fragmentation, insert, remove uh, operations on any, any namespace. It doesn't have to be memory. Uh, so it doesn't make any assumptions about uh, backing, or you can tell it not to make assumptions about backing. Uh, memory. Uh, and so, 
that was it. We just plugged that into the PGS uh, array management. So instead of manually going and trying to mess with the PGS array, we just said, okay, well, we'll, oh, sorry, we'll, uh, we'll use extent, we'll register the entire PGS array namespace into the extent, and then just tell the extent manager to do it for us. And it was brilliant, it just worked. It was plug and play, literally. Um, and so at this point, um, we were ready. Um, so yeah, at this point, uh, things, were, things were going well. And uh, Nick Hudson, mostly, and Maya helped uh, me integrate um, most of the code. And again, like what could have been a real mess, it was like two weeks and most ports were like done. I mean, 70, 70 architectures, I was pretty impressed. <laughs> uh, it could have been a nightmare, but um, you know, the methodology really, uh, so the hero didn't do it, the tests did it, I think. Um, Performance is really interesting. I mean, uh, it's really simple performance testing on uh, for this uh, code base because all we all we are interested in is how fast can you find, uh, you know, a segment given a, a physical offset. That is literally the fast path operation in this whole API. Um, and so it was really, uh, and there's a, there's a, essentially a macro uh, that wraps over this function call. So literally, we just had to performance test one function, and that was pretty straightforward. Um, so what did we do? Well, we had, um, you know, th these, these, uh, these tests um, had to factor in the fact that there were fragments memory um, segments, uh, because this was not the case previously. Before Unplug was available, you know, all the segments would be contiguous, there's no big deal, uh, at, you know, finding out the same algorithm could find them out. But here, if your segments were fragmented, then your RB tree starts getting, um, you know, uh, filled up in not necessarily symmetric ways, right? So, um, so we wanted to see what impact that had um, on performance. And so what we did was we kind of um, faked the, um, uh, so we used random to essentially uh, fake the, um, the effect of a running system. So we used the random system, uh, system call to um, essentially uh, sort of spread out the uh, the physical address offsets of all, so uh, you could, okay so you could test it saying okay from zero to the end of RAM you know run through a loop and see what page, uh, FISEC find uh, gives you but um, in this case um, you know that, that you know that's one way to do it or we could just sort of randomly uh, look up offsets and that's that's what we did so. Um, so we did a uh, you know ten uh, you know hundred calls to ten million calls kind of uh, kind of breadth of uh, calls and and uh, again you know random so it, on a real running system uh, physical addresses are not necessarily randomly looked up right I mean there's a lot of caching a lot of code that keeps running repetitively so this is not really um, an indicator of the actual system performance uh, and this is sort of work to do or maybe a comment about how this kind of testing can be done in a slightly different way. Load testing, I think, is not really um, mapping straight onto ATF testing. Um, but um, essentially, um, yeah, we just, you know, uh, we used what we had, and all this stuff was done in user space. Um, and so, um, yeah, so we, you know, we applied different uh, scenarios, so fixed size segment, fragmented segment, just to see what effects it had on the performance. And uh, we'll get you some nice graphs but in a minute. But uh, yeah, so this is what it would look like. Numbers would be pulled out uh, like this. And then, um, yeah, and then uh, we got tables. And uh, you're welcome to look at that la uh, later on. But you can, yeah, I mean, so the, the, you can see the, you know, you can make a quick uh, scan through the tables. But the top one is RB3 and the bottom one is static array. And you can immediately see that the RB3 implementation is taking more time uh, you know, to uh, uh, find a segment. So I wanted to see, you know, how bad it is. Um, so, yeah, this is just a sort of, uh, uh, you know, testing between 10 million uh, segments and 100 million segments kind of thing. Um, um, so, yeah, so this was the statistical kind of methodology we used because we were using random. Uh, so we had to kind of compensate for that by using uh, making a statistical approximation about how, um, uh, you know, how much confidence do we have in the actual number we're getting. Uh, and so we kind of, uh, you know, we, we stuck to a margin of error of uh, 95%. Uh, 
I, I didn't do this work, so uh, if you have any questions, I'll redirect them to Santosh. Um, but anyway, um, uh, so that's the number, 5.59% uh, degradation in performance, um, which, you know, depending on how important it is for you to plug or unplug your memory live, um, is a design choice that, you know, somebody can, a manager can make. Uh, so, um, so there we are. And... Um, Right. Um, yeah, so that's the details of uh, the uh, fragmentation and uh, how we did the tests and colorful graphs. But you can kind of get an idea um, of, yeah, so th those are graphs of the average maximum and minimum times for different, um, you know, uh, numbers of segments that were being tested. And, uh, yeah, just to go over some of the things that we were probably missing. Uh, originally, when I uh, designed the um, a API, the ideal API that had all the, uh, you know, cache attributes and this and that, uh, we actually looked at ROMP testing, uh, testing on ROMP. But the problem with ROMP was that there was a whole load of assumptions inside of ROMP and a whole load of dependencies that we'd have to bring in. Uh, and so we abandoned that. But I think for load testing, uh, ROMP is pretty good because it can uh, interface with actual user space workloads and exercise your code paths. So I think uh, ROMP is interesting for load testing of this kind of uh, behavior. Um, yeah, code, well, we could, we could have a bit more code coverage. I mean, that's a question of how much time you have to um, uh, address. But more importantly, I think maybe if we could get some live numbers as well to make a comparison to uh, the numbers we got with user space uh, testing. Um, with with Dtrace. Um, I'm not sure Dtrace, I haven't used Dtrace on NetBSD, but I don't know what the state of it is. Uh, anyway, maybe we'll get some feedback on that later. So yeah, this was the, the big, uh, you know, moment of enlightenment. Um, you know, uh, existing techniques, nothing fancy, no heroism required. Uh, just, you know, apply interest, you know, standard techniques and you can do cool stuff. Um, I definitely had a much less stressful experience than uh, debugging Zen intrap handlers. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> this is really cool. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, it did help that there were um, APIs inside of NetBSD that made the least amount of assumptions about what those APIs, uh, the context in which those APIs could be used. For example, uh, you know, Arbitree could be, it's a, you know, it's a user space library, but it can be used in the kernel or the extent, um, you know, API does not as assume anything about the nature of the backing RAM, for example. So really cool to have that kind of tooling available inside of the kernel. Um, so, I mean, literally this sort of, pitch is for people who have access to or know uh, about hardware that uh, can do hot plug outside of uh, virtual virtualized environment or even inside virtualized environment. I think VirtualBox, um, QMU has an ACPI interface for hot plugging that I had a look at, but it was way, you know, our ACPI stuff is a bit shaky at, uh, at the moment. So a little bit more work required for that. Um, Zen is the easiest to do. And I've done like a, a, a really um, simple stub plug implementation. Uh, what's missing is that if you want to uh, unplug code, your driver needs to uh, kind of... Inter so there's a little bit more work required for unplug because uh, obviously you can't just unplug memory that's being DMA'd to or like, you know, memory that, uh, you know, is being used for something. So there needs to be a way to uh, figure out, uh, you know, if, if a page that you want to unplug is uh, in use or not. Um, and that... Uh, you know, th this can be, you, I mean, this enables that, but it, it doesn't um, do it for you. So if you're writing a driver, obviously you have to, you know, there's a little bit more work for that. And also exporting this functionality to user space, um, you know, uh, use, use, if you have a RAM control kind of utility that talks to the kernel and says, pull out this offset of RAM or whatever. So that API needs to be designed and, and so on. Uh, but the basic uh, interface with the virtual memory manager is in place, and it's reasonably robust, I think. Um, I haven't seen any complaints of weird page faults or panics on various architectures, so far at least. So I'm keeping an eye on it. But um, So yeah, and um, the cool thing is that the VM system is probably the, you know, the, the most, uh, one of the oldest uh, in pedigree, um, because obviously all the BSD started off from a similar VM uh, system. So I feel like other BSDs could actually benefit uh, from uh, this work. So FreeBSD especially, I've had a look at their VM code and, hmm. but uh, you know, they could benefit from uh, this stuff. Uh, OpenBSD I think uses UVM. So uh, 
Um, I think it should be fairly straightforward for them, but VBSD might need to put a little bit more work into it. Uh, thank you, all these people. Uh, Philip's here. And uh, yeah, the BSD Foundation. We coded this by the beach. Uh, we spent four months. It was brilliant. <laughs> I highly recommend it. Philip knows about it. He's been to the venue. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's, uh, that's the credits. And yeah, thank you, everyone. And yeah, uh, five minutes. Yeah, we've got five minutes for questions. Can we kill the balloon driver now? <laughs> uh, well, the balloon driver could use a hot plug. Uh, so, um, yeah, right now the balloon driver uses the hack that it uses KMEM alloc to reserve memory and then you know keep it away from the rest of uh, UVM from reusing it. Uh, but it also interfaces with the hypervisor. Uh, you know, so there's an assumption there about how that API works. So we could reduce it to an API that's kind of named balloon, but does something else. Should probably be called Hoplug now. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the KMEM alloc stuff would uh, change. Uh, for the benefit of the video, can you explain what Anita is and how it worked uh, in your workflow? Um, yeah, so Anita is a continuous integration um, setup that NetBSD has where um, uh, all the ATF tests inside of the NetBSD source tree, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, are a kind of, uh, so your source is built and then all the tests are run. Um, I'm not sure for what the frequency is. Go on, sorry. And it is a Python, uh, you know, wrapper that actually uh, takes a build and after that it uh, spawns up either a UVM or another emulator, runs a NetBSD install, you know, from scratch, and then starts running the tests. So it builds a new environment, a new system, make sure that everything works from, you know, the installer to actually running the full test suite, and it completes. And runs, uh, there is in relang.netbsd.org, you can go and follow the link, and uh, uh, it has uh, several architectures that run uh, daily, and others that run on emulations daily, and others that run on real hardware, you know, weekly or whenever people get to run them. Um, uh, the um, um, E386 um, runs eight times a day. Um, uh, Spark we aim to run uh, twice a day and um, others about at the same uh, frequency. All right, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> now the, quest the real question is, uh, so first of all, I think that we don't really unplug and plug memory all the time. This is kind of a, an event that doesn't happen too often. So optimizing the whole thing to an arbitrary seems to me like kind of an overkill, right? Because, you know, you could just say stop the world and rebuild your array. Isn't that uh, a feasible thing? Or what, what, what other thing does arbitrary buy you? Uh, that's the first part of the question. And the second part is that the unplug is the most interesting part of it. And, you know, the, the reverse lookup is what you want to have, really, is to basically have the subsystem ask, okay, who's using those segments that I'm trying to unplug right now? And if it's a device driver, the device driver needs to relinquish them. And if it's a process, we have to wait for the process to finish or we decide to kill it or something, right? Yeah. And that's, uh, yeah. have you given any thought on that? Yeah, this is a trick question. <laughs> um, okay, so... Uh, I, uh, I have fleetingly thought about it, uh, and, in, and we, um, when we did the work where we really had to um, have uh, deliverables, uh, we wanted to you know, put it at a point where we actually had some functionality. Um, and so initially, I did actually go around and write a very rudimentary uh, RAM control uh, tool just to think about how uh, a user would interface with uh, you know, the kernel. Uh, but it turned out that that is a house of cards that's going to fall very hard. Um, so um, my thought about this is that if we can incrementally uh, start, so the RBT question I'll come back to in a minute. But uh, my thought is that if we could have, um, if we, if we could have users, um, uh, so for example, Zen or uh, any virtualized environment, 
is the immediate one that I can think of. And then, uh, you know, there's heavy metal um, architectures out there that have ACPI-based hot plug, and I'm not sure of the other architectures, Spark or, and so on, but I'm sure that the server um, industry has these hardware-mediated RAM um, plug and plug uh, things. So if we, ca if we could have just the basic um, sort of plug on plug operation for specific cases that are maybe th that's memory that ha is, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, not DMA'd or, or, me or memory that is only uh, allocated for a restricted set of things that can be tracked. So, for example, things like maybe the mm, some kind of cache, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure which ones, but we'll have to you know, do the analysis. But a restricted set of these pages could then be looked at. Because the state tracking, again, it's, you know, it's, that's a huge effort to figure out um, the reverse lookup of what page is used by what subsystem, and then to keep track of all of that, and then to make sure that this particular page is not being accessed by anybody. That, that is a significant search problem uh, in terms of such space. So yeah, Taylor. Yeah, I'll come back to that. <laughs> Is it often the case that you will want to use uh, memory that you have hot plugged for, say, DMA or kind of you know driver specific specialized purposes like that, or could you? Um, prefer to allocate DMA memory from what is provided in initially at boot and prefer to provide uh, hot plugged memory to say user processes where you could just, you know, you, you could uh, unmap them and move the page data to another page and then uh, remap them and let the user, user space continue. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a pretty, uh, that's a leading question actually. So I think bus DMA already has, uh, and this is a machine dependent question because perhaps one can imagine that you know, there are architectures where hot plug memory can uh, be used equivalent to boot time memory, and then there are other architectures like x86 where the first 16 megs is, you know, only accessible to certain types of DMA controllers and so on. So I think that is a machine-dependent question. Uh, um, uh, sorry, I missed the main part of your question. So my, my question is, um, could you uh, uh, use this as a way to avoid having to do the search uh, the reverse lookup problem, and yeah, just yes. make, it sim you know, make, make the problem simpler by pretending harder cases don't exist. Y yeah, more. Yeah, so that's kind of what I was leading to with uh, when I was saying that we should probably try and restrict where unplug is done inside of certain categories of of memory or certain um, memory management APIs like Bus DMA or um, I can't think of something else at the top, you know, off the top of my head, but. Um, yeah, so restricted categories of, of uh, RAM could be, you know, that's a start, I feel like. And then, you know, different subsystems can then decide whether they want to use this or not. And then eventually, we could kind of have a sort of global... It's a complex problem. I don't have all the answers right now. But um, it needs, definitely it needs analysis. But I would say, I would like to actually, when I get spare time, this was a funded project, thanks to the foundation, but... I would actually like to look at various use cases and start doing this, you know, bits of uh, categories of RAM, and then see if this uh, API can be exercised. Got two minutes to answer Christos's original question, which, uh, which was, uh, why RB3? Um, I think the simple answer to that was, it was available and it was easy to use. Um, and uh, yes, we, um, yeah, I mean, uh, we could, use something that was already available. So in, in theory, we could go back to the uh, array implementation and make it do what the RB tree does now because we have the testing infrastructure in place to make sure that it doesn't fall apart. So actually, there's nothing stopping us from going back and reworking the array implementation to do exactly what the RB tree stuff does. So yeah, so it, it's possible. It's just that that was convenient and we thought that it, it, was, it was not a very organized decision, decision, but we kind of asked around about the performance implications and we thought, well, We'll just find that number, 5.x percent, and throw it out and see if people complain too much. And if they don't, then we're just going to you know, <laughs> push it in. <laughs> but we're not forcing you to use it. You can, you know, you can optionally use the uh, array implementation without hot plug and then the RB tree implementation with hot plug. And uh, if someone's up for you know, doing a hot plug implementation of uh, you know, using the array, you're more than welcome. I'm happy to, <laughs> to you know, uh, help with that. So. Thank you very much.